I still need to. Oh, I thought I got the music fixed for that. Darn it. What's up, Brian? How you doing? <laughs> hey, how you doing, Jeff? I'm good. Good to see you. And Rich is here with us, which is fantastic. Hey, as Rich. always. Dude, how are you're you doing? Rich, your show every weekend has been awesome. Like, it's now <laughs> become like a routine in the house for, in our house, for um, family chores. Like, projects oh, around the house. Awesome. So, like, I've been, I, I, <clears throat> in our kitchen, we had this. It's an older house built in like 79. And, in the kitchen, they had this recessed lighting, which is basically like a soffit that they built. And then they put like mm-hmm. the really terrible sort of like, like metal rails with diffusers and then fluorescent lights. It was so horrible. And so I ripped that whole structure out, but then, and I painted it inside, but now, then it just looked like a gaping hole with blue paint. And I'm like, Hmm. So I was installing, uh, I bought one by, or uh, two by ones, like, um, like door casing. And then I installed that around the edge to look like a picture frame. And, it was great because I just had I had Rich's music going the whole time, and every now and again I hear Rich say something like, "Like, oh, this this song goes out to Tall Boy or whoever else." But like, oh shoot, yes, I need to get in there and interact with people. It was cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I gotta say I really uh, uh, Rich I feel like is on uh, the harder end of this global like uh, how this balances out across the globe, where um, uh, we get the benefit of Rich's show for anybody that's based in the U.S. Rich's show is like 11 a.m. Pacific, our time, which is actually pretty awesome. Uh, 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 for me, I missed the show because I had to go. We had a sudden like uh, uh, soccer game that my daughter was asked to play in. And so suddenly I was driving to Manteca, um, oh my gosh. Uh, which if yeah, it's the Tatooine of California. <laughs> um, uh, so I had to. I go to Manteca for the weekend. By the way, I'm from Manteca. So if there's anyone that's like there, that's like, hey, that's pretty harsh on Manteca. I'm from there. Um, like, so, I can say uh, that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, that's my community. So um, uh, on a side note to that, one of the things that was really cool was is we, we I actually was blasting some of the music at one of the last soccer games like two weeks back um uh because awesome. we have like a big bluetooth speaker and so i had it broadcasting through the speaker um but yeah uh rich was like the the sound of uh the big davis soccer tournament for a while dude rich so, you're the uh, you're a new so dj yeah. for the bay area you didn't know you were being syndicated exactly. out here but you are <laughs> that's a thing yeah that's uh, awesome. awesome stuff man um good deal oh yeah what a week um it has been a wild week and um I wanted to say there was some new Star Wars news, but I can't remember what it was. We were talking about books and stuff ahead of, uh, before this, and mm-hmm. I a book I just finished. So um, Kevin Scott, who is one of the, uh, I mean, he's been a writer of Star Wars for years, and he does does a lot of the High Republic comic books. He was part of he's part of Project Luminous, and um, so he's been like a critical piece of the the new High Republic stuff that's been coming out. Mm-hmm. And he wrote a new book, um, actually an audio drama called Tempest Runner. So in the High Republic, the main antagonists that we're seeing, there was the Drangir, which are the these sentient plants. Um, they seem to be taking control of a back, sort of a backseat at the moment. But the Nihil, mm-hmm. these space pirates, are amping up. And it's interesting how much of a threat they actually play to the galaxy and to the Jedi, which is wild. And in their hierarchy as, as um, pirates, they're... they're um, they all their phrases the the phrase they use is called ride the storm. They all ride the storm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and so their hierarchies are all set based off of storms. And the main mm-hmm. <clears throat> the main person who's like the main head of them referred to as the eye of the storm, one person. And then the three like li- sub leaders are called tempest runners. And then they have um, like storm clouds and clouds mm-hmm. and whatever below them. It, these different names. Anyway, one of the tempest runners, one of the main people is this character Lorna D. She's a Twi'lek. And they did an audio drama. I'm like, I they kept calling it an audio drama. I'm like, it's an audiobook. That's that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. But I get it. And it's one of those audiobooks that um uh who like Marvel and others have started doing in the last couple of years where it's like ten like there's a main voice actor playing the main character, but then like ten or twelve other voice actors playing all of the other parts and there are sound effects. So That's it's cool. it literally sounds like you're listening to it's like you're watching a movie without there being a movie like because they're not That's just sound really effects cool. it's not just sound effects for the sound of it it's like like really rich deep sound that is happening around so you like you feel like when there's a prison scene and things are happening you're hearing cells unlock and close you're hearing trays bang around because people are having food in the commissary like it's oh, really wow. 
Yeah, dude, it was fantastic. I like, I could not put it down. I, I every walk that I did, everything I did for like four days straight, I burned through the book in like four days. Um, oh wow! Yeah. Um, so That's that really came cool. out. The new, um, I don't have it in the shed with me, but the new, um, a new holiday book came out called. Mm -hmm. It was Kevin Scott and George Mann wrote it together, and it's like, I think it's called Life Day Celebrations a collection of stories oh. <laughs> about life day. It's awesome. And I haven't actually cracked it open yet, but so many good, so much good new stuff has been coming out in the last few months. The, they've been announcing plans for the next year or two. Um, right on. And fun fact. So we, my wife and I planned a trip for to SoCal. We were going to go to Hawaii. That didn't work as COVID stuff. So we're going to take our trailer oh, yeah. to SoCal and into the next month. And the campground that we got is not even a five minute drive from Disneyland. And oh, we're like a day or two from like, I think we're just going to buy tickets and go and not tell our son about it really. Cause I just want to go to galaxy's edge and get my lightsaber and sure he can come with oh, me too. Yeah. But I'm like, <laughs> I keep telling my wife that she's like, what do you want to do there? I'm like, this is literally the only thing that I want to do is get my light. She's like, Jeff, it's just a store. We buy it. I'm like, no, 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 not the it's store an experience. It, there's an experience. They are not the yes. same. <laughs> No, and there's a thing that happens that I, I like, like there's a video on YouTube that you can watch or several, but there's some that are very, very well produced of the experience of actually going into the, the saber making, uh, of, uh, like, like process. And apparently there is this moment that everyone talks about, and I'm, I, I don't think I'm underselling this. Um, uh, I, I, I have, I have heard people say it was life changing. <laughs> Uh, uh it, it is it is this apparently this moment where it just all kind of comes together and um it is a really really cool thing that happens and uh uh, uh anyway uh, i've only heard i've not participated myself the last two times that i've gone to uh, galaxy's edge uh the first time was just uh we we weren't even supposed to be there and um, uh, my wife and I were there in town with uh, our young twins, and it was uh, almost magical because uh, we were able they uh, get kudos to Disney. Kudos to the kid that worked at um, the uh, Smuggler's Run um, uh, because I was already like, I, I didn't know how I was going to feel about it. And of course I've talked on previous shows. Uh, it was amazing. I felt that it was a totally immersive experience. The sounds of the spacecraft flying overhead was like, I just, I, I was like, Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Um, uh, Cause I could hear, I could, it's a spaceport, So I could hear the ships take off and, um, and they were all around you, you know? Um, but, um, uh, I don't know if I've ever told this story, Jeff, we, um, uh, and I, and I hope that you have the same magical time there. Uh, we were at, uh, the smugglers run the ride where you're riding in the millennium Falcon. We had the two twins. Uh, we were learning about how we could do like, uh, swap out rides and, and all the other things. And they were like, Oh, we don't do that for this ride. And we were like, it's okay. Um, we'll, we'll come back another time. And we were totally cool. Like we weren't even asking. They, they literally came up to us that. We were just out there kind of like, I was just taking in the sights. And this kid walks over to my wife and I, we have two twins, um, two little twins that are with us. And um, uh, he says, and like one of the characters that's on the ride is a character named Hondo. And he says, would you guys Hondo like to Anaka? ride the ride? Yes. Oh, yes. of course, of course, you know, Hondo. Yes. Um, so, um, so he says, uh, would you guys like to ride the ride? And we said, yeah, but you know, we have twins and it's a little hard. And he's like, well, I think Hondo can make this happen for you. And um, he then tells each of us, he work, goes back to his people, comes back to us, and they escort us on to the ride one at a time. One, uh, uh, my wife, I was like, oh, you should go. And she's like, no, 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 this is like, you grew up with this, go. And so I went on the ride and then my wife went on the ride and um it was uh it was amazing it was like being a kid again i i, I really will feel, say that like <laughs> and i'm not like a crazy disney person or like oh like uh this and that no it was it was it was like being a kid again and that is awesome. uh, yeah I, I hope that you have the exact same experience i hope you do make it over there and i, I hope and, so. and Dude, just, now i hope so i'm like i want to meet hondo <laughs> yeah no, he's the weak oh the weak way everybody the weak way pirate everybody loves to hate and loves to love yes he's just fun yes Oh my gosh. And it was so cool. And the Hondo, you will, you will see and interact with Hondo. And, um, but just the, 
I, and I think I've talked about this on the show previously, and I know that this isn't the topic. I, this is the topic we're going to get to. But as per usual, we will have a runway that gets us there. Um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the whole experience was amazing, and it was so immersive. But one of the things that I really liked and you get this all over um, Disney is, you know, you have a lot of people, you know, dressed in character, a lot of really cool things. Like I loved how when you were kind of walking through um, uh, the kind of marketplace area, it felt very much like what you would see in the Mandalorian. Um, uh, but, and, and there's all these like little, like uh, all this little great detail, like these little square pieces that are like, you know, like light switches, except they've got the big, like light squares mm -hmm. for push button items. But, um, I was always a big fan of the A wing. I was always a big fan of the X wing and I, spent, I was, oh, I always liked the A wing. I always thought that was so slick looking and there is an A wing that's just parked out there. And it just blew my mind to see it. Uh, I was I was blown away when I saw the Millennium Falcon. I was blown away when I saw all the other stuff. But when I saw the 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 A wing, I was just like, man, this is like, this yeah. place is just it's unbelievable. So, it's so interesting that you say it because the way that <clears throat> when I think of the ships you just said, like I'm gonna be excited to see the first two ship types. No, no. The A wing though, it almost feels like the real spaceship. I don't yes. know why to say that, but like the Millennium yeah. Falcon and the X-Wing almost feel like the defaults. Of course, you're going to have those. And we yeah. love those. But, but the A-Wing almost feels like this is more like what a real spaceship. So I can imagine it almost feeling like, no, but this is the real one. Like, this is the real thing that I'm looking at now. Like, now I feel like I'm actually seeing a real A-Wing that really came out of space. I don't know yeah. why. It, it was so cool, Jeff, and it was one of these things too, where like, so I've I played a lot of Star Star Wars video games growing up, and one of the games that I probably uh, poured way too much time into was um, the Lucas Arts uh, X Wing Fighter Simulator. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, and I know we've talked about that on the show, and I had the X Wing Fighter, I had the B Wing expansion, I had the Tie Fighter expansion. Like, I really got into X Wing versus Tie Fighter. I had all of it. Um, but I was always partial, even though it made the missions crazy hard because the A-Wings got terrible shields, um, and it doesn't have proton torpedoes. It has concussive missiles or concussion missiles. And, um, uh, I just thought though it was, it was such a Buck Rogers like shit. It just looked <laughs> like something out of like, you know, the, the old pulp science fiction, like, yeah. like that's what the A-Wing looks like. And, um, uh, and that's not to say that I don't like the others. Like I was, uh, uh, I've, but, but when you're there, Jeff, and you're seeing these ships and oh my gosh, the droids, the, I, I've, I, I've always been partial. And, you know, we talked about this in the last show. Like I've always been partial to the technology and I, I have always gotten really into like seeing how the technology works. Um, but just the, the watching, uh, when I got to, when R2 came to up to me, I was like, how did this happen? Uh, like, like this, this, this little guy, here's, here's my favorite character in Star Wars, R2-D2. And, um, and I felt weird saying, I got to take a picture with this guy, but I totally did. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, it was just, it was really cool. Again, oh, I, gosh. I know this, is, I am not a theme park person. I am, I, I, I am a big, like, I love going to cons. I love going to wizard con, mm -hmm. comic con, all the things that we have here um uh i've never been someone who's like oh i gotta go ride the ride of the thing um but geez the detail the sh just the amount of detail that was there oh, and the dude. blue milk was pretty awesome i am so beyond excited okay now i have a reason to go to my wife and say we are definitely doing disneyland like i was on the <laughs> fence about it before because of covid and all oh, do things. it but do i'm it. like but i want these things so bad i want this experience it what you're describing <laughs> reminds me like of a more in, like what will probably be a more intense set of feelings of what I felt when I walked into the um, the Star Wars area of the Funko Museum in West in Hollywood. Oh wow! When I walked into that, and it's not the same because they're not they're not live action; they don't move around. But you get to sit yeah. down at Mos Eisley across from Greedo. R 2s in there with C three people, but they're all Funkos, like full size, like yep. life size Funko bobbleheads. And I was like, <gasps> I have a picture of me sitting in the sitting in the uh, in front of the table across from Greedo. Like kind of looking all casual, like leaning back. I have a picture of that someplace, and I have a picture with R two and C three PO, but the full size bobbleheads in the Funko Museum. Um, <laughs> it's going to be more intense than that. My mind is going to probably explode like four or five times at least. I'm sure. 
Yeah, and I just like I just like and you you like me, and I'm sure people watching the show know this too. It's like, and anyone that cares a lot about this uh, about Star Wars, it's like if you get into like the minutia of like, oh my gosh, like that is Luke Skywalker's lightsaber, um, uh, and it's right there. I can go and pick that up, oh, um, uh, and and it just looks so real. Um, they have all of these props that are out there. They have all of these people that are just walking around. Stormtroopers are just walking around. Um, uh, it, yeah, but it was just the it was just the little touches of things. But the thing that got me the most was you kind of walk through this passage to get in there, and and I'm not going to say exactly what happens as you walk through, but I will say that when you get in on the other side, and you're kind of hearing that, you know, the 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 all of the little whistling of ships above you, mm-hmm. and you there's not ships up there. But I, it, it, you feel like snap, like I'm at a spaceport, and That's awesome. um, uh, yeah, yeah, it is something else. It is really something else. And even the moisture evaporators, there was just out there, and I was like, and I'm sitting there. And my my poor wife had to hear me name everything. <laughs> um, uh, like, I'll never oh, warn look. my wife ahead of time, babe. This is just oh, gonna yeah. be a thing. You're gonna have to be okay with it. Or you know what? Let me just talk at you while you have AirPods on. I just need to say this stuff out loud. It's just going to have to happen. Oh, no. And it was, like, so cool. And uh, it just happens that, uh, like I was saying before, like, uh, my my wife and I were, were um, uh, my, my daughter's actually having to put together a, a project this evening on uh, her family activities, like who she is. And uh, the thing that I'm looking for, but I can't seem to find because we had to go and print this photo out. I thought I had it on my phone really easily um, was um, we took a big picture as a family in front of the Millennium Falcon. And it is like uniformly all of us are happy that we took this picture. We all look good in it. And it's like, uh, uh, there's seven people in my family and to get all seven of us to say, this is a good photo of us. Um, it was great. And the million pockets are backdrop. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) And you know what? This is probably a really good place to tangent into tonight's topic. Um, because as you're sitting there, I was trying to think of a way like, Oh, what's a good segue into, you know, the topic. It's interesting that you bring this up because a spaceport galaxy's Mm. edge, Disneyland, all these things. And, What's interesting about all the things we've talked about in the show, you know, since its inception have been, we talk about the stories for people watching who haven't, if you're just, if you're actually, I should just do this first. If you're just catching in, thanks for being on the show. We appreciate it. Um, I'll do a little, I'll do a little thing here. Hold on. Where is it? There it is. If you wouldn't mind, Ah, if you wouldn't mind subscribing, that would be amazing. We would love you to subscribe and likes and all that, all the likes and the subscribes and things. Yeah, there it is. Um, so since the inception of the show, what, you know, a large part of what we do is talking about um, the stories, people behind the stories, characters behind the stories, yeah. what makes up these stories, why they're important, all this. And one of the things that's amazing about Star Wars, just like Star Trek, which we do mention quite often on the show, too, is there is a, div- a multitude of races and new planets and creatures and ways of thinking about things and societal norms and differences and all that. It's what makes these stories rich. It's what makes any story that we're used to as humans rich. And I think mm-hmm. going to Galaxy's Edge or going to Disneyland and, or even Disney World and be experiencing this with so many different types of people from different places, experiencing like you would experience at a spaceport, I think is a really good way to think about things like xenophobia. And obviously, I should say, I really want to emphasis, emphasize obviously, obviously things like otherism, racism, classism, mm-hmm. whatever the isms happen to be, is going to have to exist in those stories because... I, I think I made this reference in the la- either the last show we did or something similar where we were talking about something and it made me realize that like the matrix, I'm not a big fan of the matrix oh, movies yeah. myself. Like they're an entertaining, but I, it's not really my thing. But I, what I do remember is in one of the, in one of the, um, uh, one of the movies, Neo was being told that the matrix created thousands of times or hundreds, some huge amount of times before the one that everyone was used to in the movies because every one that they started off making was like some form of a utopian society and human brains just rejected that completely. And Neo and humans are sort of like, or maybe it was Morpheus from, um, uh, one of the, one of the, um, whatever the character was. Oh no, it's, it's agent Smith. He's explaining to him. Like, uh, he, it's agent it was Smith, to Morpheus, right? When he's kind of drugged up a little bit. Morpheus. Yes, yeah. Okay. Morpheus is uh, in the chair and That's he's right. handcuffed and agent yep. Smith is like, you know, this is the peak of your society, you know? This is it. And, uh, yeah, yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't give you a perfect world because you wouldn't accept it. Yes. And I think 
no. in that he's sort of not sort of he's very much denigrating human beings for that purpose oh, or yeah. in that situation what's interesting about that though is if you reverse it and think about it from a different perspective it's not a bad thing it's humans gravitate towards um as people in stories we gravitate towards things that can be realistic that we can imagine actually occurring so when you read fantasy and by fantasy, I mean, el you know, high fantasy, like elves and gnomes and the D&D &D sort of thing, as well as reading things that are like, or fairies, you know, fae, the, the fae in like I Northern Ireland and Scotland and those areas, the D Adels mm. and things like that. Um, but it's also the same as reading um, anything that's from a comic book, whatever, that just talks about how beautiful things are. And there's some conflict, but not much. It's fantasy. We see it as fantasy. We can't imagine that ever being real or true yeah. because it's too perfect. And not that... Not that it's not like, well, we don't, it's not that we wouldn't want those things, but it can't, it doesn't resonate with us as like, but that's not real because I, nobody's ever going to just get along in these ways, um, at least a hundred percent of the time. And I think it's really interesting to, to bring this topic up specifically. And, you know, I mean, we, we, you picked the word xenophobia and I think it's a really good one to have here, but I think it really is also a kind of a translation to the, the isms, the, the racisms and the classisms yeah. and, um, you know, other ism, basically all of these things, because that's how sentient beings are going to interact. You have all of these thousands and thousands of different worlds in star Wars with different races and, and creatures and different ways of viewing the world and thinking of them, different religions and belief systems. And for so long, most of them never came in contact with each other. And then hyperspace comes along and it just takes thousands of years before some of them even interact with one another. Um, then there's like the core and the mid rim and, the classisms and things between those groups and the outer rim and wild space and people were from different places or creatures. And so I know we're going to get into more of that tonight, but I think it's a really interesting topic because whether you see it as good or bad, I mean, racism, things like that in, in the real world, yes, that is bad, but not including them in these stories, I think would actually be a massive disservice to the story because it makes it more real. When you hear that, you can, the real world that we live in, you can see it in the story that you're reading and it, it almost makes the story resonate with you more so that in the vein of art is subjective, you can begin to see more of your own life and the things you experience in that story. And the same way that someone else might see a different set of those things, but they're all informed by where we come from and how we grow up. Oh yeah. I mean like the art itself is a reflection of history. I mean, you know, the empire is dressed like a bunch of Nazis. Um, uh, the, um, uh, one of the things I, you, you know, you brought up Star Trek and Rich is here, so I can just talk about Star Trek a little bit. <laughs> um, uh, so not bury the lead. This is really a Star uh, Trek no, show. <laughs> so, so the, the, the thing that I, 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 and I think you kind of were talking about this is that you almost need to have, um, we as a people are a flawed, you know, we're flawed people. Um, we, we have a lot of hangups. Um, it, we get in our own way. And um, in in the world of Star Trek, um, uh, humanity has overcome its 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 how does how is it said? It's gotten out of its infancy. Uh, think, we yeah. we um, I, I I think that's the line. We we've, we've gotten out of our infancy, and instead um, we are humans for we are humans for one another um uh we don't have the hang-ups or the personal disputes uh anymore um we've eliminated things like poverty and the uh, the accumulation of uh or or identity through the accumulation of goods i'm gonna sound like um uh, a bernie bro here i think i think um, picard even says in not first contact but um Maybe it was first contact where he says yeah, we've contact. eliminated the accumulation of wealth as a driving factor or force in our society or something like that. Yeah, exactly. And so he's uh, he and and but but the conceit of that is it's humans in the future that the only reason why they're able to act this way is that somehow some way between now and then a thing happens and we evolve as a people and we're able to overcome our differences we're able to set aside petty squabbles or as they make fun of on star trek not fight over um economic systems um uh and and that's these are like huge things because 
um, humanity evolved in an us and them type of scenario. We're, we're a, a species that's cautious and we're so worried about, um, uh, uh, you know, what's out there. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's an incredibly brave thing to, um, to, to embrace someone who is a stranger or you don't know them or you don't know if they're different than you and to mm -hmm. say, I will learn about you. Um, because that also opens you up to having to learn certain truths, not only about them, but possibly about yourself. And that's a lot of like big human work that you have to do. And it's, it's, I think the goal, like, that's the thing I always liked about Star Trek was that was the goal. Um, the, the, what's crazy is, is, um, in that goal, there is a freedom. There might not be order, but there's a freedom. Freedom for people to live and let live. P freedom for people to love one another and, and, and just be themselves. And, and, and that's amazing. And I think the dichotomy that you find in Star Wars is what do people want? Is it order or is it freedom? And the Empire and several incarnations of that are trying to sell order. And they do that even too through homogenized uh, class structures. Like you look at the empire in the movies and it's all humans um, uh, versus the rebellion, the rebel alliance is, is filled with aliens, they're non-human species. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all of these groups and they've come together for one thing, which is they want freedom they don't even have a model for governance yet even though they're saying we're the rebel alliance to restore the republic they don't even have a model for governance all they care about is freedom and and so that's where it's like i think star trek's conceit is humanity somehow evolves in the future and is able to set these things aside star wars is a reflection of how we are now which is um uh, 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 the, the types of natural divisions that we have against the other, mm -hmm. our tendency to form us versus them societies, and sometimes our confusion with things like freedom and um, community with justice and order. And yeah. um, these, these things can kind of, um, as, as with most things, they can kind of sit in the eye of the beholder. Absolutely. I think a quote, I was, I wanted to look it up to double check that I had it right, but a quote that is really interesting that is kind of some, to a degree summarizes what you were just saying is in the, the very beginning of Rogue One, when director Krennic, um, shows up on, I forget the planet name that, um, Galen Erso and his family are living on because Gary Galen um, ba bounced and was like trying to get away from the Death Star project. And yeah, yeah. He finds him, and as he's talking to Galen, he says, or Galen says, we were, or Krennic says, we were this close to providing peace and security for the galaxy. And Galen says, you're confusing peace with terror. And Krennic says, well, you have to start somewhere. Yeah, I mean, like, again, I that's a really good, I mean, it, it, that's a perspective of the Empire. That's the, the perspective. It's, it is, I don't even know if it's a perspective of the Emperor himself. What's interesting is the emperor has basically ceded so much of that stuff away. He doesn't even want to deal with it. Um, I forget which audiobook I was listening to. Um, I, I'm re-listening to the Tar I was re-listening to the Tarkin book, and there are several scenes where Palpatine and Vader are talking to one another individually, and Palpatine mm -hmm. is irritated because he wants something taken care of so that his generals and Grand Moffs and Moffs can run things, so he and Vader can go do the Sith stuff that they really want to do. And he can step away even further and be like, yeah, run this crap. I don't want to deal with it. We're going to go back here and be, you know, creepy Sith people and do our stuff. And so it almost makes me wonder like, does Palpatine even, does Palpatine even care about this? But he fosters in his underlings, the ability to feel xenophobia and like almost yes. thrive on it. Like make it, yes. make it like a core tenet of who they are, that they are xenophobic and that, they don't care about, they actively are intentionally not caring about the lives of others so long as in a fascist regime, the state is all that matters. Your yeah. desires don't. The state is the only thing that matters. And if you, and, these logical fallacies come into play easily and thrive be, are thrived on specifically because it is a, it is a fascist society. 
Yeah, I mean, um, uh, it's, it, it, I mean, again, like they're, they're very much modeled off of, um, what you would find in like kind of a Nazi Germany, yeah. um, or any type of fascist system. Um, uh, that's I mean, what the empire is. Um, the ISB uh, and it, the SS, I mean, <laughs> yeah, they're basically yeah, the I same. Mean, I mean, I did fun fact, and I didn't know this. I just learned this, that the SS uniforms were designed by Hugo Boss. Mm -hmm. Didn't oh, know that. Oh, they were designed by Hugo right. Boss specifically to look intimidating and sharp and and also very specifically to look like a thing you would want to be. Like, well, I don't want to be on the other end of that. I want to be that. So I don't have to do yeah. that. I don't have to deal with that. So they were they were made very specifically to be crisp and sharp and also extraordinarily fear generating and intimidating. Like that was part and parcel and we could see that in the isp we don't see the isp on camera very often um in in the shows and what have you but it is implied that when they show up they're the the spies and they're the they're the secret police who show up to you know check on what you're doing and if you're a good imperial citizen or something oh yeah and i mean that's like the heart of the heart of fascism is is that level of control like mm -hmm. i mean you see that in things like 1984 um, you know, uh, uh, you see it even things like Minority Report. Um, uh, these are all these are all elements of uh, thinking outside of the norm is is a crime, and um, uh, that's why it was. Uh, I actually kind of like how Star Wars, the original Star Wars, starts because it's the kind of the last. Even as Tarkin says, it's the last vestiges of the old Republic are swept away. They've they have disbanded the Senate. You know. And uh, even if it was just a, a Senate that, you know, was only, you know, was acting in name only and had no real power, it was still at least a, um, it was still a, a, an example of democracy or representative government of some kind. And all of that has been replaced. Um, and, and, and a big part of fascism um, uh, or xenophobia as it's used in fascism is to also help to eliminate the other or whatever is considered the other um as as less value have have less less value it's 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 something that you can do away with i i mean you know no one's like no one is acting like princess leia when they're like yeah we're gonna destroy alderaan um like that is a crazy thing that happens that's an entire planet that's gonna be destroyed and that one dude's just like heck yeah man let's do this and um it's just my job uh, dude that, i don't know yeah it's exactly. just my job i don't have a beer when i'm done i'm good and and it's not even necessarily that you know these people agree with it or not as much as they feel like they're in a system where they have no choice and that's really the difference between order and and even a monicum of freedom is if you can walk away from anything and go you know what this ain't me i can't do this um you guys do whatever you're gonna do but i'm not gonna be a part of it mm -hmm. versus you're in a system where you have to participate um uh uh and and xenophobic actions and you and again like you see it i love i always liked the contrast of what you saw in 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 the star wars movies which is um the empire was exclusively human um uh often exclusively like uh um uh, uh white uh human people uh they had a homogenous look um and uh, uh that that it, that says a lot about what the empire was trying to value or what the empire was trying to control and then you have all of these other races uh and species and in aliens from all these different planets who are basically being um uh uh, uh, uh enslaved or um they're being uh destroyed they're being murdered they're being forced into labor look at the wookies um uh all of those things are are happening and that's why they are supporting the alliance to the restore the republic uh because while the republic might have had its problems it certainly wasn't like you know destroying entire uh planets or even worse um, you know, enslaving cultures, uh, for in perpetuity. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it, it, some of the notes that I took when we were kind of prepping for the show are around individual, like people or cultures. And it's, it's interesting because what you're describing is basically the, 
you know, the Nazis in Germany did this, but there have been other societies that have done this too, where you said it before, where you pick an other, usually one, but group them together that are different than you, that you can easily point to and say, there was a time in the past, usually 30 years before, but sometime in the past where we're awesome, now we're not, and it's their fault. If we can get simply just let me just get, let us take power and get rid of them and things will be awesome again. At, at base like that's what it is yeah. and that's very much what the empire does like we're going to get rid of all um diversity and create homogeneity across everything and then look we'll have peace and that yeah. line from krennic that the the dialogue between our interaction between krennic and galen urso um is really interesting in that in that case because you know krennic just he doesn't really care about terror he doesn't really care in my opinion what he cares about is himself. He's 100% self-centered. He's only inwardly focused. He only wants to rise to the ranks. That's all he's looking for. He's going to say whatever anybody thinks needs to be heard by senior ranks or Palpatine or whoever to get him to that place. Um, I don't know that he really believes that terror and all that stuff is the important part, but he sees this as a path to glory for himself. And so that's what he's going to do. And he doesn't, we've talked about that before. The Sith are very much that way. It's like, it's not inherently bad. They just see that I have, I'm trying to get from point A to point B and anything that's in the way between the two, I'm just going to knock out of the way and, you know, get to point B. And they, I, it's too easy. It's too simple to say, well, they're just immoral. It's like, yeah, it's, they're immoral from your perspective. And I'm not saying that his character is good, but it's too, it's too simple and too clean cut to say that a character like his, as an example, is simply evil. It's like, there is no simple thing about being evil. That is not, it is not simple by definition because it's a matter of perspective. There, his character as the example, Vader's character as well. Like Vader, to, you know, the most evil character, also, like that's not really true. Like you do reading on what his body is going through on a regular basis to make him feel pain and anger makes him more powerful as a Sith, but it's pretty much pissing him off all the time. He has no arms or legs, he is a walking mm. torso basically with no skin since skin that's being prodded by a suit for 30 years straight. Like who the hell wouldn't be pissed off all of the time, <laughs> all of the time. And that anger is going to drive you to do almost anything you can possibly think of to make it an outlet for your anger. Like, so it's too simple to say these characters, these characters are inherently evil, but I think it, the, the character arcs do lend, um, they do lend to things like racism and things like that within the stories. But I think it's, again, it comes back to like, you have to have that nuance. We've got to have that intricacy between these characters because it's what makes for a story that actually resonates with you. I mean, a good example of this for me is um, the Zygarians. So the Zygarians are mentioned mostly in animated series, but also in some books. Um, I think mm -hmm. books back into like, uh, like 90 or 91 is when the first time they were mentioned someplace in a book. But their whole culture is based off of slavery, 100% off slavery. Um, I actually did some reading on it to find out for sure, but there was no point in their history where they weren't a slaving race. That's what they do. And inherently, to be slavers, you have to not, not just not care about the creatures that you are enslaving. It goes beyond that. You have to basically never see anything other than your own race as anything. They're just, they're nothing. They they don't matter. They're, they're just things that we trade and buy and sell like any other commodity there is not sentience there there's nothing there that i should concern myself with it's and even though they are jerks about it we watch them in the, in the animated series they're rude and evil and all these things they act all those ways at the end of the day they're not they're not just being jerks or mean to the slaves because they enjoy being mean they literally do not see them as anything other than a commodity or a good or service to trade so to go back to that evilness, like it's great to have that sort of character because we can all look at it and go, slavery is bad. Of yes, objectively, slavery is bad. It is just bad. We know yes. that concept is evil. Yes. There's there's no there is no argument here. That is an objective truth. That said, in especially in this case, and in any case in modern in in the society for the last two hundred years, people who trade in slaves, and even in the real world, but in slave in 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 um, Star Wars too. There's more to them than simply they're just plain evil. There is more to them. And I th I think that's good that we see that because it lets us also 
sort of parse that and lay that on top of what we see in the real world and what we've dealt in our own history, our country's history, the world's history, to better understand why those creatures and those races get to the place that they do, how that comes about. And it makes for an interesting story. It makes for a a story you can actually attach yourself to. Yeah, I I think I think that the issue is is that I'm okay with this saying like, oh, like we don't need to paint with a broad brush the evilness and just say, oh, they're evil. Because that actually that actually diminishes how bad a thing is Mm -hmm. like i actually think that um there are inescapable reprehensible actions that you can conduct in life and even if you are a victim of culture or circumstance you're wrong and i think it's important for i think it's important for um people to call out that wrongness you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and so it's kind of like um vader is he's an evil guy and you you know oh you can paint that brush but i think you can actually go and say he's manipulated he is um he is a product of all of these things that have happened to him himself growing up as a slave um being um uh taken in as a child soldier into the jedi uh 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 being taken away from his family at a very young age um I, i'm sorry i do have my problems with the jedi i think it's so weird oh, that they're like oh yeah we're just taking no, the children you, you um, say that it's like it's uh, back it's back to our previous conversation about the decline of the jedi and that's a, that's a oh, show yeah. we should really talk about more like that was a great there the way that the jedi approached bringing new kids into the jedi order at a young age in the time of the the galactic republic that we're all used to was pretty different than it was even a couple hundred years before that so yeah that's i I think it's a whole other show we should get into (laughs) Uh, yeah but i i think where this ultimately goes is uh there's a line that in guardians of the galaxy that i absolutely love and it's when um i think it's drax he's like made this like huge mistake and he's just trying to explain himself and he's like you know my children and my wife was killed and my daughter was killed and of course any of us that would be put into a position like that would know you know god forbid like something like that happen but then rocket raccoon says something he says we all have dead people and it's uh it ultimately comes down to terrible things happen to people literally all of the time and those people then don't become genocidal maniacs and um that's where it's like you uh, the when i was talking before about the reprehensible ir- irrevocable things about someone's actions and pasts it's their deeds that you can judge and that's what i always think to, when i look at like evilness inside of stories you can have like these un uh, largely like ridiculously big evil characters like Sauron in the Lord of the Rings, where you can say the ring is evil. Like these are just like broad brush. We need a bad guy. Here's our bad guy mm-hmm. and it's him and it's the devil. Um, um, but what, what it really comes down to is villains of course have a backstory. They are often the heroes in their own story but we as the objective the uh the uh, hopefully the objective humanists the people that can say you know this is wrong we can judge them for their actions and not just their thoughts and their background because again luke has terrible things happen to him and he isn't like you know what i need to do slaughter children (laughs) like darth (laughs) vader has like a pretty like anakin skywalker has a unbelievably impossible path for redemption um uh yeah he saved his son but that's it i mean he he's he has just done that and to luke's credit he's not messed up he is messed up enough to think he might have to kill his nephew um uh and it's and and uh in and obviously the last jedi and then you start to see how things like pain and trauma are one of them is the voice and the other one is the echo and it just keeps running down through time 
and many of you who might be watching this might, we're starting to get a little deep here, but many of you that might be watching this might have your own family issues, things that go back into the past. And often your parents are dealing with things that their parents did to them or with them, mm -hmm. and then their parents and so forth back up through the chain of the human race. And we're all trying to work these things out. We're all trying to deal with the um, uh, inadequacies or feelings of insecurities that generation previously have, have felt and then forced through time all the way to us now. Except some of us are able to say, you know what, that's not me and I can do, I can be better. And other people are like, no, I'm, I am buried by this. It is, uh, what's the line, past is prologue? This thing that happened behind me, that is my fate. And that's why you have people then, be, again, racism, xenophobia, the, uh, 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 feelings of superiority over other people, those are taught lessons. No one's born with them. Yep. And so, so we're often trying to work out. I, and I'm sorry, Jeff, thank you for giving me the time to talk this one out. Um, I feel like we're often trying to exercise the demons of the past. And some of us are a little bit better than others. And some of us could probably be even forgiven for not being able to handle some of those demons if they are so great. But ultimately, you have to be held accountable for your own personal actions because, like Rocket said, everybody's got dead people. It's super true. Um, you're making me, a lot of what you said make me think about um, Thrawn. And mm. specifically in the um, most, not the most current, not the current trilogy that is ongoing, but the previous trilogy where we learn more about, where it starts off and we learn about how Thrawn was introduced to the Emperor introduced to the imp the Imperial Navy and works his way up through it. And there's a couple books in the series. Um, th it's a trilogy. So there's a couple others after that. Yeah. But in the, in the first book, what you realize, and I realized and why I fell in love with the character is we are shown Thrawn in several other instances, specifically in the Heir of the Empire series as being just a bad guy. He's just a bad guy, strategically amazing as a bad guy. What what's interesting is this, and you know, when you read this book, he Timothy because Timothy Zahn writes all of them, so we know it's mm -hmm. coming from a source of I don't want, I don't want to say it's just canon, but it comes from a source of this is his Timothy own. Timothy Zahn. Yeah, no, yeah, I mean it's, it's like, his, I mean you know. well when I say I don't want to, when I say I don't want to use the word canon is I I don't want to overuse that word I want to use the like the <laughs> phrase the phrase like this comes from the mind of someone who has been thinking about this for a long time so he yep, these yep, desires yep. for this character they didn't just randomly pop up he's a, i mean you know better than most he's a writer so those those oh, ideas yeah. as neil gaiman would say those ideas were already put on the compost pile for writing them many many times that he draws on from things he's been thinking of to write these stories and in that first book you you learn a lot about how much xenophobia exists in the imperial navy because he's paired with a character named eli vanto and eli mm -hmm. Vanto, so thrawn is not human he's he's near human he's a chiss blue skin mm -hmm. red eyes different personality types, et cetera. And Eli Vanto, this person, this young person he's paired with is human. Looks just like anybody else in the empire, except he talks with a, as they pair it, they, they imply he is from wild space. Um, so he's still part of the empire or they're part of the empire. Um, mm -hmm. But as they put it, he has kind of a Southern draw. And so the, the, what they're basically implying is he's from sort of a backwater. That's what they're they're trying to unfortunately overlay the term backwater on top of the American South, which is it's, it, that's crappy to do. But but yeah. it has a really good it does it does a really not good is the wrong word, but it does a really it has a really um, it's a really impactful way to uh, to get you to realize oh that's what I think they're trying to say here without actually saying it because they just say he's from wild space. People think of us as backwater. Um, and he talks with a bit of a southern draw, and it just all that implies. Oh, I, I get what they're trying to pull out here. Um, and even better is the fact that he's partnered with uh, Thrawn, and Thrawn doesn't see it. Thrawn doesn't. So when he tell when Eli tells him these things, Thrawn's like, "Oh, okay. I don't understand that. It doesn't make any sense to me because that's that's not the way at least Thrawn thinks. Chiss in mm. general think differently. Thrawn is very much unique in this regard." But it's interesting because as it goes through the story, what we learn more and more about Thrawn is that 
as much as people in the Empire can't stand that a blue-skinned alien is making its way through the Imperial ranks, he's succeeding, and the leaders have no way to really push him back. Um, had have no way to actually stop him from progressing because he does such a good job, but he, he realizes, and he's pretty tactical in how he works with the people to realize that he has to behave particular ways, except in politics. He is mm -hmm. terrible. He cannot read politics. He can read art and all these things about the culture to interact with them, but it's recognized many times it's called out in those books by Eli and by others. Sir, you really need to learn how to understand politics. And he's like, I will endeavor to do better. But that's, he just never gets really any better at it. So he needs other people to sort of be a partner with him to help. But he is pushed back constantly for being who he is um, because of the level of xenophobia that exists. Nobody likes to see him, except what's interesting, and you brought this up, is the lived experience of his crew when they first meet up with him and on the ships they go that are with him. Mm -hmm. For the most part, they're like, oh, God, who is this guy, blah, blah, blah. And then they start to learn over time that even if they don't like him because they've been trained and taught their whole life to not like the other, an alien who looks different than you and behaves different than you, most of mm -hmm. them, if not most of them end up coming to a place of having respect for and will defend him. Even if they disagree and they don't necessarily like him, they will defend him because they're like, no, no, we have seen his logic prove out time and time again. He always has a real reason for what he is doing. He does not fudge that. He doesn't deviate from that. And he will not put people in harm's way needlessly. So they come to trust him. Whether they, Even if they admit they don't like him, they come to trust him. And it's interesting because you made the comment that these things are taught. And I, you're, I mean, you're mm -hmm. obviously so right. And we see it all the time. That's a great place where characters can unlearn things. The unlearning process, though, takes some intention and it takes time. And especially when they're adults. Because as kids, they're moldable. They're malleable. We can teach them these whatever we want to teach them. Society, into parents, whatever. And it will stick. It just stays. As an adult, it's much, much harder. So it requires much more intention from the recipient of these, lear these educations um, to want to change. And at first, most of the characters don't, but a large chunk of them do. And they end up thriving under his command because it rewards them. He's good at what he does. He rewards people who do good work. And they eventually see, and several of them are like, no, no, I, he is amazing. I will stick with him. But it's so interesting to watch that particular because it's such a complex set of stories because nothing happens easy. There's nothing in his story that happens quickly and smoothly and with very little pain. All of it is struggle, period. And mm -hmm. I think it's so interesting to, to listen to because he's not a Jedi. There's no magical powers, no space wizards, none of that. He is just a stat. He is a tactician who studies a society to learn what to do and takes the best approach he can possibly think of and reads the angles and studies it and does all these things. Yet everything is still difficult for him and he has to work through it. To me, every time I read one of the books, I'm like, holy crap, like I need to think like Thrawn. Like I need to spend more time learning and prepping and reading. And I learned and I like th those are the lessons I take away from his character. But it's so interesting because if that conflict didn't exist, the xenophobic things, the racist things, the classist things, if that didn't exist in his story, his story would almost be meaningless. It would almost like not really be an impactful story. And the things are bad, but it's almost a good way to it's almost a, a really good or it's an effective it's an effective way to convey those things to us, the readers and go, that makes sense to me. I get that. I don't, I feel a lot of complex feels and I get it. Yeah. And I mean, again, I think it's important to kind of like, uh, I think it's always, you know, what is it? Um, this, uh, I'm, I'm like blending too many different uh, metaphors together, but it's like uh, context is for Kings. Uh, there you go. If anybody's watching Star Trek discovery, um uh, uh <laughs> context is for kings so it's like really important to kind of have that history i think what to like understand like where is this character coming from also i mean you know at the end of the day timothy zahn's writing a book so he's got to have drama that's in it if he's just got a guy who's like mr burnsian and he's like yes <laughs> excellent, then it's like that's a seven page book and by the way like a really good example of someone who's done that in the past and has overcome some of those problems is uh, Stephen King. Uh, by the way, don't not not problems. Like I'm not gonna ever be a writer like Stephen King, but uh, Stephen King um, uh, is always working out like 
um drafts of something um like he always he he starts a lot of things in like short stories Mm -hmm. and and what's really cool about stephen king is is that he'll publish them and then he'll do another thing um uh uh, an example on a podcast that i was listening to was uh someone was saying you know stephen king's always getting his first draft out there um he's like you know here is my um story about uh, machines coming to life uh Christine. No, no, no. Here's my story about machines coming <laughs> to life. Uh, maximum overdrive. Um, uh, you know, it's he's always going, uh, he's always doing this thing where um, he's working out his versions, but the early versions are often really broad brush and you don't really feel any type of connection with the villain or even sometimes the heroes because they're just one dimensional. The villains are bad and the heroes are good. And um, back in the day, um, uh, that was kind of enough too. Like you know, early movies, like your 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 white hats uh, against your bandits, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, this this was like a really common trope. Now I think we want a little bit more out of our stories, so our authors and our screenwriters and our directors are doing a little bit more to help us empathize with who these characters are why they are who they are like honestly i couldn't have cared less about kylo ren until the last jedi and uh when um when he tells his story of being betrayed by luke being betrayed by a family member um uh being vulnerable that actually resonated a lot but at the same time and, and even his his anger, you now understand his anger when he's like, I want every gun to fire on that man. The, this is a guy who's trying to work out trauma, th- something terrible that has happened to him. And um, oh my gosh, you then see it in live motion with lasers and, and all this <laughs> stuff that's just shooting. And, and then you get the opportunity for a reckoning and that's when luke is openly saying this is my fault and i was wrong and and it doesn't mean that that kylo has to just then set all that aside but luke's giving him that opportunity for reckoning and then he even tells him if you if you strike me now it's a total reverse of obi-wan if you strike me down i'll always be with you if you strike me down in anger i'll always be with you just like your father and and that's because of the the baggage that we're carrying i'm i'm telling you star wars is an amazing story it's an amazing human tale Mm -hmm. of dealing with things like grief and trauma and trying to make the best of those things because we've all got those things we've all got those things in our past and so do our parents or the people that raised us they've got those things and they were trying to work those things out through us and we're trying to work those things Mm -hmm. out with our own children and um uh and that's why some of us try to take a path where we go and overcome and others it's like you know what it's easier to blame other people for the things that got in my way and um and that's why i think you even see that type of um in a, in a very postmodern sense i'm not trying to get all like high and mighty here in storytelling but in a very post or post postmodern sense a lot of the storytelling now demands that type of of explanatory content um uh you really want to understand like what's the background of something Mm -hmm. who are these people why is this bad person bad um another really great villain that got that treatment um who was a broad brush evil character just evil literally looks like the devil is darth maul in episode one but if you follow him all the way to the end of clone wars um you get to learn a lot about a character that is that is filled with grief pain regret remorse and is so far down in that hole he doesn't know how to get out um Darth Maul uh, is so yeah such a i'm gl- this is probably a great place a great character to end with because he's it's also a connection to palpatine and his dislike of aliens and xenophobia because in one of the stories i think it's actually in the plagueis book where we first are introduced yeah. to Maul, how Palpatine first came across Maul. He was on, he was on a planet. I don't know if he was actually on Dathomir. 
like at a spaceport mm-hmm. on Dathomir or some other planet. And he came across a, a woman who was trying to get rid of her baby. Like for some reason, couldn't feed the child, whatever else. And Palpatine sensed the baby being very strong in the force and basically paid the woman, the mother to hold on to the child and raise the child, paid her a crap load of money. He was rich um, to hold on and raise the child. And he'd come back not because he cared, but because he saw that, Oh, he will be a tool for me. And as he grew up, he taught him all these things, um, taught him stuff. But even when Plagueis and Palpatine interact and Plagueis is in the shadows, watching Palpatine teach forms and things to, um, uh, to Maul, he may, Plagueis makes the comment. You gave him the, the weapon of Exar Kun. He's got the double bladed lightsaber and things. And oh, yeah. Palpatine kind of brushes it off. Like, yeah, that's it's whatever. Dude, don't worry about it. Like, and very much doesn't care. Like, I'm he is a tool for us. Palpatine always knew it's he makes it very clear in that story that always be, knew it trusted in himself or believed but trusted in himself that training Maul was a step towards training somebody else. Somebody that would be more befitting what Plagueis and him wanted, which was a force being that they could manipulate and do things with. And by training a Sith apprentice, maybe they would see that happen. Uh, but he didn't care. He didn't have any concern. And I think that's really evidenced in the most recent, the last season of the Clone Wars. I think mm-hmm. it's the um, it's the second to last episode of the sea of the series when spoilers Ahsoka... for the end of the Clone Wars. <laughs> sorry, because it's amazing. Oh no, it's uh, amazing. Like if you haven't watched this, like oh, seriously, it's... stop listening right now and go watch it. Because oh freaking... my gosh, the music alone, the intro music alone yeah. is just heart wrenching to listen to. But in the inter- yeah. the interaction finally between Ahsoka and Maul, because they've never met each other before this season. They've heard about each other, but they've never encountered one another. And when they're finally in the throne room together and they're going to, um, before they actually have their duel, they're talking and Maul talks about all these things about the grand plan. The grand plan is, Oh, cause what is it? Who's he's like, I wasn't even privy to it. He's like, I yeah. wasn't, I knew nothing about it. All I knew is I was a small pawn playing a role, but you could see that he, the way that he behaves is almost like he has an affectation for this grand plan and how it was, how, like an appreciation i should say for how it played out and how it was manipulated over so many years and also he completely hates palpatine and the sith and every yeah. the jedi and everyone he blames all of them for all the bad things that happened to him so clearly he's still dealing with it and then of course later on when we see him in rebels and things he's obviously still dealing with all these problems and these issues and etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah, he's a fa- he's one of my favorite characters, if not my favorite character in all of Star Wars, because I mean, the way that he went out is like the best way a character could ever go out. And it it brought Obi-Wan. It it we talked about Ob- Obi-Wan as a villain. Yeah. We should do a whole episode on that. But it's a it's a single moment in Obi-Wan's life where you see a really good side of like the the you see the Jedi that Obi-Wan is like the true yeah. form of a Jedi that, uh, that what a Jedi should be in the final encounter between Obi-Wan and Maul. And I will not spoil that, but like yeah. you watch it and you're like, wow, that was it's pretty that, deep. That is how a Jedi deep. should behave. And this is how that, that story should have ended because yeah. it was just perfect for that. But Obi-Wan's got some redeemable qualities. Still a villain. Though. Still, a villain. still, still, still I don't know, the Matt, greatest villain. I don't know, in Star Matt, Wars. Matt Cliff, Matt, uh, Matt Cliff, if you're still here and listening, you can, you're just gonna have to take that one for a second and like mull on that. We both agree Obi Wan's a villain. We're gonna do Dude. a whole episode of that we're gonna we're gonna hold the line that Obi Wan is a villain. <laughs> I mean seriously, like I mean the moral relativism of uh, <laughs> the truths are in your point of view, and um, you know I uh, well Vader's already won. You are only hope. What about my sister? Oh snap! You found out about that. Oh now I gotta tell you uh, that dude is gaslighting. He's gaslighting people for generations. Um, <laughs> and Anakin's the father, isn't he? <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's some deep, deep crap that uh, oh my gosh. doing to people. Oh, he has. Um, we're doing. Uh, an entire, we're going to yeah. do an entire episode on this. We'll broadcast it wide, and and we'll just drop that on Twitter everywhere. And see what people we can get to join the show. And be like, wait, 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 what, what? We yeah. should just invite and a bunch I, of people on the show to like say, well, here's. We don't tell them what the subject is. We drop it and say, okay, so here's what we're starting with. By yeah. the way, everyone, Obi Wan's a villain. 
and Obi-Wan's we just stop. Obi Wan is the villain, um, and 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 it's and I don't understand. I I feel like it's so obvious. Um, uh, uh, you know, he yeah, Luke is being manipulated for two and a half movies in a in a almost Dumbledorean style. I know everyone's had to hear me say that in the past, but it's like <laughs> they're yes. almost raising him to be a lamb to the slaughter. Um, uh, yeah, we'll have to do a whole episode on that. I've been uh, wanting to do that too as like a special video because I know we've been looking at doing yep. some special content. And I thought, oh, that's that's that'd be a lot of fun to do. Um, is Obi Wan is Obi Wan Star Wars a uh, uh, greatest gaslighter? Um, obviously, yes. Uh, but I do want to say one thing um, uh, before we close. Uh, Michael K. Williams, uh, he's an actor. He was on The Wire. He was on Community. He's an amazing actor. He played Omar Little on The Wire. Uh, he was the original uh, cast for Dryden Voss. Uh, but then couldn't be a part of the reshoots and Paul Bettany became Dryden Voss in um, Solo, A Star Wars Story. Um, uh, He passed away and oh my gosh, he was this amazing talent and uh, I would love to see, and I don't know if it's out there, maybe someone could point it out to us, uh, if there were any clips of him as the original Dryden Voss. He, uh, He just passed away and uh gosh it was it uh uh his participation in the star wars universe uh i was so excited when i heard he was cast uh i was bummed out when he couldn't participate in the reshoots with ron howard but um uh yeah really sad because uh i think he'd been a great great addition uh uh to the star wars universe really great actor i totally agree i totally agree yeah well, listen, everyone, yeah. thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. I'll throw it up one more last time. If you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe. We really appreciate it. We're trying to, we want to build up this new Kessel Chat channel, get some likes on there. Um, and Ryan and I have been talking about for a while, recording some videos. We've been both super slammed at work, so we will absolutely get working <laughs> on that. But that is a thing that is coming. That's why we have this new channel. If there's any comments yeah. you have or input you have on video types you want to see us do, let us know. Otherwise, good deal. I think we're out for the night. Have a good one, everyone. Hey, thanks, everybody. You have a good night. Cheers. Bye.